Well, we're back. Huh? We're, we're back here at TLC 2019. Uh, my name is Ryan Thomas, and I'm going to be the host for this TLC session titled Getting Everyone on the Bus and in the Right Seat. Please join me in welcoming our special guest presenters, Allison Reef and Alan Belcher. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming today. I'm Alan, and it would be my pleasure to uh, share some of our research with you. And with me also is Allison. Hi, everybody. I am a lead faculty for our VA programs in ECE. So we're going to go ahead and get started and we're going to mute our faces and we'll be back in a bit after we go through our, our research. All right. Our research was twofold. It was an attempt to identify perceptions of need for professional development for early childhood education faculty and to determine that faculty are teaching the courses for which they are best suited by credentials, interest, and performance. Specifically, the faculty we are referring to are associate faculty or those who do not teach with us full time. Faculty performance was measured by instructional quality review scores, which are based upon faculty's ability to foster critical thinking, provide instructive feedback to students, demonstrate high expectations, establish relationships, and share in structure expertise. It was also measured by end of course surveys, which were completed by students. Faculty support and development associate scores, which are a measure of faculty engagement and course completion rates. The professional development needs were determined by self-perceived needs for professional development, evaluation of current professional development opportunities, an alignment between credentials and or experiences within the course approvals the faculty were granted. The goal was to ensure higher levels of course completion by students and better retention to graduation. As the university strives to ensure transparency in the valuation of faculty performance, the same evaluation measures can and should be used to ensure a high quality experience for students. And before we started our new research, we consulted with existing research. Research by Con Condon et al, as cited in Harris, shows professional development for higher education faculty has a positive and measurable impact on student learning. According to Shadad and Shirazin, it is an extremely important to, that distance educators and support providers are equipped with professional development opportunities to match their learning environments as teaching online is substantially different from teaching in traditional classroom environments. Online teaching includes roles related to pedagogy, facilitation, technical assistance, content expertise, instructional design, and adult learning. According to Scarpina, Riley, and Keithley, if faculty feel that they have the support of the university and are engaged with the university through their professional development opportunities, they will apply their new learning and skills to their courses and engage with students at higher levels. When faculty feel connected to their learning community, they are less likely to be passive participants, instead become active participants who learn, apply, transform, and lead. According to Busey and Wesley, there is a need for improving the training of early childhood educators. The faculty who have the responsibility for providing the education of future and current teachers have a need themselves for becoming more informed users of research within the discipline. So this led us to our research questions. So based on the review of literature and the goals that Alan and I set forth, the following research questions were developed. To what extent do ECE associate faculty feel a part of the university? To what extent do our measures of faculty performance, which include IQRs, end of course surveys, uh, FSDA scores, and course completion rates, place faculty in the best teaching environments? And to what extent does our current professional development activities prepare associate faculty for teaching here at Ashford? I'll pass it back to Alan. So then all faculty that were aligned to the one or other of the ECE programs over here in the College of Education were surveyed to determine their perceptions on professional development and their knowledge of how their teaching assignments fit within the college's program. 
And additionally, performance measures, such as the end of course survey, the, the peer reviews that we do, the faculty engagement scores from FSDA, and the course completion rates were analyzed on a section by section basis to determine if faculty are assigned properly for teaching. With a little over 60 associate faculty to have data analyzed, the entire population was sampled. Data collected were analyzed qualitatively by looking for themes in some of our open-ended questions and quantitatively in SPSS for correlations between some of these variables. We had a response rate of 32% of all the faculty that were surveyed, which is kind of smaller than what we had hoped. But here's, uh, here's some of the questions that were on that survey. We wanted to know if folks uh, received that email that we think we send to all, all faculty each time they start a new course. We wanted to know if our associate faculty knew who the program chair for the course was. Then we asked them about their professional development uh, needs, what Ashford has been offering to them, and how those matched up, and what other types of professional development might be appropriate for them. So this series of questions from the survey asked them, you know, what they thought was important about professional development. We also wanted to know then how much they gained from the professional development that we provided to them. The results of those questions, you know, a on a scale of one to five, along with the gap between uh, how important they thought it was and how much they were gaining from, from it were analyzed. And here's what we came up with. So if we look, again, this is on a scale of one to five, one being not important and five being very important or very helpful. Um, you can see the various kinds of things that we offer on a regular basis, how important those things were to our associate faculty, how much they believe they gain from them, and the difference, positive or minus, between those things. So all in all, you know, those are a, a decent set of scores and some things that we might expect. Another series of questions ask the series of topics that were important for professional growth, not the events that we provide, but the topics and how well those needs were being met. The results of those questions, again, on a scale of one to five, one being not important or we don't meet that need, to a five, meaning it's very important or, or, and or we meet that need very well, along with a gap, shows a little bit different story. So for instance, if we take the topic of technology, our faculty gave it a 3.94 on that scale as how important it was and a 3.82 and how well we meet that need right now for a small negative gap. The biggest one in the bunch here though is the online teaching strategies. You'll notice that they think that's very important, a 4.5. We do it at a 4.06, but that's a negative gap of about half a point. From their responses, then, we started to identify, from the open-ended responses, we started to identify needs in the areas of teaching online pedagogy, career growth, content expertise, and relationships with people at the university. In regard to pedagogy, the respondents were looking for opportunities to share best practices and to observe courses that are strong examples of of stellar performance. Another pedagogical area mentioned in the qualitative responses was online teaching strategies. While we offer course and program specific webinars that were evaluated as important and demonstrated some value gained, the respondents rated online teaching strategies as important for professional growth, but again, that negative gap that we see. So from this information then, the respondents feel that we adequately explain courses and our programs in general, but stated that we needed to further develop how to successfully teach within the courses. A common theme within this topic was guidance in providing instructive feedback to students. So based on the analysis of the study, we suggest the following conclusions for future actions. First, in order to meet a variety of indicated needs of professional development, one possibility could be the establishment of professional learning communities in the online environment. 
Possible topics might include live, live webinars around specific courses of interest or centered on online teaching practices for associate faculty. Ongoing professional learning communities might be an appropriate measure to ensure long-term connections among faculty. Certainly, when faculty feel like their thoughts are heard and considered, a stronger connection to the course, program, and institution can be made. These conversations, in whatever form they take, may be an important part to improving faculty performance. Associate faculty will be able to ask questions about the college and ongoing policy changes during the professional learning communities. Getting answers to their pressing questions was another benefit of this type of communication. It may also include um, improved communication with associate faculty on the topics of course sequencing within programs and the courses that overlap from one program to another will help to understand how the various courses and the faculty's role fit within these programs. Knowing the prerequisite courses and expected knowledge base for each course should help faculty better understand how to approach courses and students. Second, a program-wide conversation about course completion rates should occur. This conversation, whether live and or in a recorded webinar, can discuss current state of completion rates and desired goals. Individually, faculty's completion rates can be shared, noting any areas of, of success and need, perhaps prior to the webinar, so that faculty are fully prepared for understanding of the concepts. The data showed that course completion rates were the measure to correlate with faculty performance and should be used to identify the faculty that should not be teaching the various courses. For example, any individual faculty member with a course completion rate over time of less than the expected 95% might be in line for some sort of professional development or intervention. Additionally, assuming no change over time in the faculty member's course completion rates the faculty member may no longer be assigned courses to teach. Third, associate faculty are asking for the opportunity to interact with our full-time faculty and associate faculty peers. This can be accomplished through course and program specific webinars, as well as professional learning communities. As part of this interaction, associate faculty wanna talk about and see best practices in a non-evaluative arena that incorporates the practices of not just the full-time faculty, but also associate faculty who represent high standards. Currently, for the most part, this occurs in an annual evaluation rather than as peers. Creating additional mechanisms for increased communication about strategies, research, and early childhood content is needed. Finally, there needs to be a systematic review of data points about faculty performance to ensure proper course alignment. To help further the university's desire to improve retention and ensure high quality academic programs, this study found appropriate faculty to teach the various courses in the undergraduate ECE programs. While program chairs in the College of Ed have in the past approved or disapproved individuals to teach various courses, there have, had been no systematic review of all data points of faculty performance coupled with faculty's own, own desires to teach, to find the right people to teach each individual course. So that brings us to our references in case you are interested. Um, Ellen and I can come back on here. Um, I see, I know we have a lot of our ECE faculty here with us, but um, what stood out to me from our, our research that Ellen and I found is that a lot of our associate faculty didn't quite understand where they belonged. Um, they didn't know, besides their their course leader who sent them an email saying that I'm here for you as, as the person who oversees this course. And even sometimes that was a little rough uh, from, our, from our respondents. They, they didn't understand what program they were aligned to. And um, with that, we assume that if you don't know which program you align to, you probably don't understand the, the program learning outcomes. You don't know who the program chair is. You don't know where this course falls in the sequence of all of our courses. So that was um, a real awakening for us and um, helped us to get started. Uh, we had some help from Holly and Steffield 
Holly Lopez, um, but we're working on trying to create a org chart, which has been slightly disrupted since last week, but um, of letting people understand where everyone falls, the programs are in, uh, which courses overlap. A lot of our ECE courses overlap um, across multiple programs, and that can be confusing to our associate faculty. So really, it's just led us to be to realize we need to be a lot more transparent and we also have to really work on building these communities so that they feel that they are a part of our university and not just an add-on. I don't know, Alan, if you have anything you want to add? Well, one other thing that we did find as we went through this was that we had a number of folks who have been approved to teach courses uh, over the years who may or may not have had all of the credentials we were looking for. So as we are continuing to try to find the best people to teach the various courses, we, we, we took some folks out of some courses and you know, tried to align them more closely with what their credentials and their experience um, demonstrated that they have the opportunity you know, to, be, to help our students be most successful. And um, as Allison mentioned there, that was one of the things that really had not been done in quite some time if ever, at least you know, in the last several years, to review people's credentials, and that that was part of. So, you know, we looked at their credentials, their their desires of which courses to teach, uh, and you know, their experience to try to f get people into the right courses. So, we would be happy to uh, entertain questions from anyone about uh, the research or our findings or any of that. We can go to chat. We can uh, have you come online and and talk with us either way. Alan, I'm curious if you have a sense of um, the types of strategies that they were looking for. When we think of teaching strategies, it's quite a broad umbrella. Did you did mm -hmm. they give you any clarification of what what strategies they were looking for? Was it grading? Um, giving better feedback, engaging in the discussion? I think most anyone who identified something specific uh, was concerned about instructive feedback. And I think a piece of that comes from our instructional quality review process. That has been now for a few years, the lowest of the five criteria on the IQR, the instructive feedback. That's one that seems to be very, um, it's one we can very easily point to in the IQR process, whereas something like instructor expertise may be more diffused over several activities that, that we expect people to uh, participate in. So we can certainly see that in operation. Uh, we can comment about that. We can talk to our associate faculty about that, but then they come back and say, well, we'd like to see you know, more concrete examples and that sort of thing, which is, I think too, one of the, one of the stronger reasons for us to have the new COE 101 is for people to be able to discuss that and see examples of that. But uh, I would say that would be the, the most commonly uh, mentioned item. And I think also um, for our ECE team and um, just kudos to Tisha Shipley and um, Steph Field, but with our ECE conference, we're really good about presenting ECE content um, and we're also, uh, I know multiple programs do uh, webinars and um, leadership series, and we're good about getting content out there about the field. But I will say we haven't done a lot of focus on, besides course specific information, on actual pedagogy and teaching adult learners. And a lot of our ECE faculty come directly from ECE classrooms. They are in the field. They're teaching at Head, head Starts or uh, private uh, preschools. And so they may be lacking the, the skill set on, on how to work with adult learners and also how to address um, dif different needs. And so I think that's definitely something we can take on in the future because we've all studied that um, and that's in our repertoire. So that could be a good focus for us moving forward. And I think that was something that you know, we discovered that matches up very closely to the previous research that we reviewed on that is that the preparation of people who are going to teach early childhood educators, and that's you know a, a lot of you in, in the audience there, 
that is that's a real real big topic right now in early childhood work altogether. Yeah, um, Nacy is doing a lot of work right now with the professionalization of our of our field, and that includes having people who are preparing the people who are out there. We we had a really hard time finding research that talked about ECE in the way that you are the person preparing the teacher, not that you are the teacher. Um, so definitely some room for more research going forward. So those of you that are looking for research topics, there you go. Other questions from anyone? Well, then Ryan, we will turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Alan and Allison. Great, great presentation. Uh, thanks to all of you in the audience who joined us here for this TLC session. Stay tuned. There's lots more TLC to come. Have a great day.